Hello again, everyone. Welcome to another edition of Discovery Road. I'm James Nelson. In this episode, we'll find out about the long running story of horses in the American West. First in the pioneer era, where they were very important in helping people plow through and make it out here where it was pretty darn rough. Then we'll open up the corral a bit and learn about the joy of horses, riding horses, jumping horses, rocking horses, and yes, before our roundup is over, we'll have a little time for some horsing around. So partner, let's saddle up and go for a ride, shall we? The story of the horse out west is really a story about people in the land. Towns, farms, and ranches, the horse it seems ever present on that landscape. And horses seem to be the answer to whatever test pioneers faced. Steep mountains, severe weather, swift, deadly water. Nothing too much for the horse. Horses were essential. They were the, the four-wheelers and the tractors and the excavators. Uh, that we have today in those in that early history. Author Steve uh, Clark has written about the American West for decades. He says the role of the horse was pivotal in settlers' expansion all across North America. When I was a boy, my grandpa had a big draft horse and, and my uncles would get on each side of the field and the horse was so well trained he would pull the plow or whatever implement it was to one side of the field and they'd turn it around and shout out, go babe, and uh, uh, it would just uh, plow the field. It was so well trained. And that was the way things were done. The sweeping San Pete Valley has many things to offer. Wall-to-wall -wall scenery, a pastoral lifestyle, and wide open space in every direction. Treat him like your boyfriend, give him a little kick. They also have a sprawling horse and rider campus that offers year-round horse recreation, a unique complex for locals to ride, rodeo, and a place for every horse event imaginable. Okay, please go, man. Right. Just step right on. Look at, look at that. that, look at that. <laughs> Okay, but if I grab you by the butt, it's only because you're falling, okay. <laughs> Officials with the Utah Division of State History, the National Park Service, and San Pete County toured the complex, the Cowboy Way, on horseback, so they could see things up close. Travis is in the ring, Sarah's on deck, Ashley's in the hole. On display during this event, horse and rider basic handling skills, jumping, and the artful maneuvering of horse and rider that dates back to long ago battlefield action. As far as English disciplines, eventing is probably the one that could cross the best with, with the cowboy culture, just because there is a little bit of rough and tumble with the cross country, and I think it's a good introduction for, all, for anybody who, who enjoys horses to just, just see good horsemanship. Um, and then I know they hold a lot of Western events here too, and it's, um, so it's kind of, it's been great to be able to use it for lots of different disciplines. I grew up riding racehorses and after I got married we just, we were introduced to some people that were eventers and uh, we just from there kind of started, started our way down this path. It is a great sport, it tests, tests the riders and the horses to pretty much every level I think and uh, it's a, a great equine sport that we've fallen in love with. I got involved in eventing through Pony Club. Um, the Pony Club in my town is Grand Valley Pony Club, and uh, the other girls in there knew about it and brought me into it, so that was <laughs> how I started in it. Um, I've been doing it for probably three or four years. This is a fairly new event, and just heard about it from the eventing website, and thought I might as well come out and try it, because it sounded fun. <laughs> uh, it was really good. Had one rail, so we went from first to second. These events are well received, entertaining, and a common sight all across America. The horse industry is big. It's a traveling road show with dedicated real fans and followers. This is our living quarters, the kitchen area, 
the two bunk beds. Um, having your house along with you makes everything easier. Kids don't have to sleep on the floor. You know, there's a refrigerator, there's a microwave, you can make coffee in the morning, shower, you know, all the beautiful things that need to be done. There are people here from all over the United States. You drive through the parking lot and the license plates are from Wisconsin, Oregon, Wyoming, Montana, Washington. It's just amazing the growth that we've had here for the city and I think for the state as well. He's a good boy so far, I'm liking him. The huge horse complex also hosts students from around the world while they learn about horses and themselves. Has it changed you? Yeah, insanely. Explain. Um, I'm not as introverted. Uh, this is the only sport I do. I used to not do a lot of sports, but now I ride horses, so I'm outside a lot more. And I get to ride all year long, having the indoor arena and the outdoor arena and the wonderful trails around here. It's really nice. One of my goals with the, the equestrian program here is to give those students who may never have an opportunity to be around horses again in their life, to ever have a chance to be horses, that opportunity to experience them. Well, at the same time, give the students whose horses is passion, give them a, a venue to pursue their passion. Horses are one of the biggest things in my life. I've been riding for 10 years, and this horse that I have, he's a forever horse. And What's a forever horse? A, for ho a forever horse is a horse that we're never going to sell. He's never leaving our family. I, I saw a lot of movies and back in China because we don't have experience like this. So we heard, like, we, we read it from, like, news. We have it on books and movies, of course, like, you know, like, Western, like, Clint Eastwood, you know, like, the classic cowboy movies and just make me really want to try something like this. And then I play video games that's basically about cowboys and that makes me even want to be like a cowgirl because I also, I also ride a horse so that makes me like closer to like what I want to become. It's all in the oh, grunt. Yeah. Little bigger jump than you that. got a grunt. <laughs> Getting on a horse might not seem like a big deal but it is to some. It changes lives. It fulfills dreams. This feels a lot better. <laughs> And one reason students are able to ride their dreams out west is because of this man, Lamont Christensen. His horses and his lifelong experience with horses, real life connections to a fading way of life. It is a dying art. People don't use horses like they used to. They're a toy now, not a, a necessity. My horses are broke and have to be used. It's, you know, they're like a tool to me. Um, they're my income. I've worked at them for 50 years to make it uh, what it is. They learn to be gentle with them. If you're good to the horse, they're good to you. Uh, these kids get confidence in these horses and build a relationship. Horseback riding isn't just about you riding and going over jumps, it's both of you together doing the jumping or the barrel racing or whatever you do. And then she stop. just realizes, she realizes, oh, I'm too fast for jumping. And she's like, stop <laughs> and jump. jump so. And then perhaps, yeah. 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 So it's not just about riding, you know, it's about, it's about growth and learning these kind of, um, these kind of things in life. Right. You guys did great. Thank you. Good ride today. Thank you. Even if they don't ride, they can come in here and pet this horse and build a bond and a relationship with them. You know, and sometimes that's all it takes to make life go. Just across the street from Salina City Hall, right there where the big horse welcomes everyone, is the start of a long-running horse story. The heritage and that connection to the roots is really important to me. I feel a great uh, sense of responsibility to carry on what my forefathers have done before me that um, has created something really unique in the industry and been 
good times, hard times, but they've always persevered. And I, I can draw on that and draw on some of the lessons that I've learned from their stories. And it's um, something that I've felt strongly about and always wanted to do. The beginnings of this cowboy business can be traced back to Mormon pioneers crossing the plains. It was in winter quarters where a little boy named Miles Burns was born. He would grow up to start a harness and blacksmith shop in 1876 in Lowell, Utah. 20 years later, his son would load the horse supply building onto logs and with a team of horses, move it all to Salina. So we have two heritage dates. 1876 is when we were founded and then we've been in Salina since 1898. And the business has just evolved. It's been ran by the family for the 143 years and six generations. And each generation has put his own spin on the business, which has helped keep it alive. Making saddles, boots, hats, belts, and lots of other things you'll find on a ranch is big business. Staying in business is the hard part. But with some young people who relish having their stamp on the Old West, the doors remain open. I think it's really important to keep that history alive um, and bringing in the younger population to keep it alive. So they, these are how our skirts start out. You know, it's just they cut out the piece of leather and then we get it and we tool all of our designs on it. Seeing such a history and an art form die is just something I can't like get behind. <laughs> like I want to learn, I want to know more, I want to just everything about it. Uh, this is one of the pieces of saddle that you'll actually tool when it's on the saddle. So you have to tool on this curved surface. So everything, all of this is carved while it's already installed. The horse and the rider have always been important parts of the burn story, and the saddle, the essential place where the two meet. So we've always understood building things for the horse, whether it be harnesses and then evolved into stock saddles, and now we've taken that to an entirely new level. Most of our saddle customers are high-end equestrian athletes um, that will perform at the national finals rodeo or in championship competition. I've been doing leather work since I was 16. I'm 24 now. The first thing that I'll do is this big piece, the ground seat. And then after the ground seat, I do a horn. Then I cover the cantle on both sides. And then I cover the swell. And then it gets kicked down the line to the next person. I kind of grew up in a cowboy lifestyle, so getting to actually build the stuff that, that is used in that lifestyle is pretty cool to me. I just get to um, work with my hands on leather. I love the job. It's awesome. It's just a guideline where I put the stitch when I sew the skirts together. I stitch that first because, of course, the hardware's in front of it. Of course, there are many hands that work on making a great saddle. And it'll even lighten up more by tomorrow. By the time James Sorensen gets his hands on it, he'll use 38 years of experience handling saddles to make sure they check the oil. I'm oiling the saddle. Uh, when the skirting leather comes to us from the tannery, it's a really a, a dry leather. And the oil puts life back into the leather. Without oil, eventually this leather will, what we call rot, but it's not really rot. It just dries out to the point you get so dry it has no strength left in it. Mm -hmm. Every saddle has to get the oil then. Yeah, every saddle should be oiled if, if you want the customer to get a decent lifetime out of it. Many styles of cowboy hats, lots of colors, and fancy names like champagne tumbleweed are big money. In each hat, a link to the past as a defining symbol of the Old West. And seeing how they're made is a bit like going to the rodeo. So here we're going to sand it, and so this is just getting all that extra fiber off that does not need it anymore after being ironed. My mother always said I should learn to iron my own shirts. <laughs> 
ship and send them all over the place. This is our cattlemen. This is our more popular shape and color of hats. The way we do our hats is it's kind of more of, it's not just your cowboy. You can have your kind of city people. You can have all sorts of different types of people. So after getting the sanded all the fibers off, we have to just finish up with a nice little burn here to get the rest of that remaining fiber. It just doesn't come off the sand paper. Anyone can wear a hat, technically, in our reality. It's just finding the right hat for you. That young man over there blowing off all that steam? Zach Wicks from New York. He came west to learn the ropes about life out here. I wasn't too sure what to expect. I had never been to Utah before, um, but I fell in love with it. You know, the, the atmosphere, the people, the culture, the, the society, you know, they, everyone here in Utah makes you feel like you're part of a, a family. Um, it's, it's really pretty incredible experience. And being at a company like Burns, you know, they, it's, you know, an adopted family. You know, you come to work and it's just like you're working, you know, with, with family and friends. So it's, it's a lot of fun in, in all those aspects. What we're doing there is just shaping a hat. Um, the gentleman just wanted a, a slightly different shape on, on his hat that we were doing up for him. And uh, basically what we were doing there is as the, the steam opens up the fibers of the fur, that was a pure beaver hat, so it opened up all the beaver fur that was compacted in there. So it allows me to manipulate it with my hands and that's what I was doing with my thumbs is just more or less moving that shape around um, to exactly where it needed to be so it looked level when it was on his face. Remember that plastic horse perched above the Burns Saddlery Store? That's Luna, a very special mascot. You see, its mother died during birthing the baby horse. The family bottle fed it. It became a racehorse, a 4-H pony, a family treasure. Our business is deeply steeped in the horse. Our mascot is a Luna, who we call our black horse, who has been a four generation horse. So it went through four of our generations, had the same horse and competed on her. And so we have a really good connection to the horse and um, love its majesty and, and just love to help it perform better. thing you can count on as you travel up and down Heritage Highway 89? Horses. Over the years we've had the chance to see plenty. Often they're the first to greet us like this horse in Junction, Utah. We had a sidewalk conversation before moving on. One late afternoon under painted pink clouds, two curious horses snorted our presence until this beauty gnashed its teeth and took over. In Wales, Utah, a twisted fence line provided a scenic image for our camera. Then a horse head dropped in for a closer look. And here, just a dog and pony show. Finally, we met a cowboy who helped us find the way to the movies. You know, those Western movies starring all of those wonderful horses. Big White Stallion welcomes everyone to Kanab, Utah in the Little Hollywood Museum, where tourists clamor for photographs on real Western movie sets. Year-round, the busloads keep coming so they can experience a bit of the American West. It's vastness. <laughs> it's, so huge. it's beautiful. It's so oh. different, you know. You don't even realize it's here until you get here. All the West was lost. Take one. International tourists roped into acting in a Little Western movie. The idea came from this man, Denny Judd, seen years ago in his gift shop, Denny's Wigwam. Denny knew a lot about making movies. Uh, this is a picture of a movie, uh, the original Lone Ranger movie. It wasn't a TV series. It was uh, with Clayton Moore and, uh, and Jay Silverheels as Tonto. But my father was uh, uh, Tonto's double in that film. And this is him right here. Judd started out as an extra in the movies and learned right away that horses, good horses, could bring in lots of movie work. 
All right, let's go. Horses were the backbone of the Westerns. You had to have horses if you're going to make a Western. And in those days, you know, we would have these huge, big Indian attacks. I mean, you'd have a couple of hundred Indians mounted on horses over here, and then you'd have a couple of hundred cavalry mounted on horses over here. So it's very easy to get three or four hundred head of horses uh, hired mainly by the, off the local ranchers and, and the farmers around Kanab. Judd also worked with Dean Martin in the movie Rough Night in Jericho. And they put Dean on the barrel and then they would buck the barrel up and down and shoot Dean from his waist up like he's riding this bucking horse. And then when it was time for the far away shot to take the barrel out, bring a bucking horse in, put me on the bucking horse and I'd ride the bucking horse. Horse riding these days involves Denny's granddaughter, an accomplished rodeo competitor, and devoted lover of horses right along with her mother. I guess the real true reason that I love horses and that I love raising horses, you know, it, it's just like any woman having a child. You know, you, you start out with them as most horses, we start riding them at two, um, we break them, we train them. And you get to watch those young horses grow into amazing athletes. And I'm proud of my horses, I love my horses. Um, I'll never be without a horse, or five or six. <laughs> um, they, they, they bring us a lot of joy. Me and this little guy, we actually won that event in Cedar City. It was our first pro rodeo ever attending and we actually won it. So it was a pretty memorable experience. Did the horse get a special treat after you guys won? They get treats even when we lose. <laughs> the real treat is perhaps the Denny Judd legacy, sharing the story of the horse and pioneer heritage with anyone who wants to go for a horse ride. This trailhead leads to the beautiful Vermilion Cliffs in Trail Canyon. It took years of planning and work to bring the old cowboy trail back to life. And the three mile loop, it'll serve recreationists, horse riders and others. But it's the name of the trail that intrigued us. Right there on the sign, Greenulch, we are told is the pronunciation, the surname for two brothers, Wilford and Harry. They were really prominent little icons in town, so I did know them. And the importance of this trail as it relates to them is that it's a historic trail. Originally was the mail trail that where they would take the uh, mail from Kanab uh, over to near Zion and Springdale and drop it off this cliff at a place called Schoenberg on a rope and then bring the mail back to Kanab. The family had emigrated to Utah from England. They set up a cattle ranch and worked it. After the father died, the brothers, both little people, took over and ran the big cattle operation from the 1940s well into the 1960s. Well, I think knowing Harry the most, I think they were the stand-up guys. They were proud men and they didn't take any bull from anybody. They just. Uh, I don't know how that had to, but they had plenty of friends around that were regular size that would help them out on the ranch and things like that when necessary. I have a history that my grandmother wrote and she said that when they were young that it wasn't a problem, but as they got older, of course they couldn't, that nobody would date with them. And so they struggled as older, you know, adolescents and as men. So the, I think that's kind of why they just kind of kept to themselves and did their ranching. The brothers built a cabin sized for their use above the canyon floor, near the cows and horses, so they could live and work in contentment. Stature shouldn't make a difference. And it's, it's really true. And they did the best they could. Our prejudice and things like that kind of st stopped people from really realizing their potential. But their father, I think he planned for them, had the view in mind what they would become and, and prepared for that for their life. So their life was more full, as full as it could be probably up to them. Now, this is an exciting day for us. I know it is for Jim and Noel and everybody that's worked on this. It's been 10 years in the making. Okay, the trail is open. The old mail route, the old livestock trail, 
and two brothers, a pioneer story worth remembering. It's absolutely for me especially because I knew them and for our family it's an honor. That's why I wanted to thank everybody uh, for what they've done. It was an unusual sight one early November day in Kanab, Utah. Two men, two big Belgian horses, and one wagon lumbering along the streets and side roads, seemingly without a destination. But we soon found out it was a very important rehearsal for an old friend. Well, I, I got the word an old, an old friend of mine had passed away, and, and I was close enough in the area that, to be able to change some travel plans and get here. Uh, in time to help with the team and the horses and the wagon, and we're going to uh, we're going to carry him to the final resting place at the grave site with his with his team and horses. That old friend was Dennis McDonald, a veteran, a cowboy, prosperous in business, cattle ranching, trucking, and an assortment of other successes. He loved his family and horses, especially big draft workhorses, like those his ancestors used to plow through the tough times in life. They brought the Amish down and Grandpa drove the teams and ever since then he has hooked. Well, Grandpa, you know, he, see his dad and his grandpa, they logged our country up there, they logged mm. it with teams. So Grandpa had always been intrigued by the teams and always wanted to get into it and then he got his chance there when the Amish come around. And he made the most of it, giving wagon rides pulled by those big workhorses, just like the ones that dragged plows, pulled logs, and hauled families generations before. These are a team of Belgian horses. So he'd had them for a few years, and uh, usually in the wintertime, they go up to Park City and pull the sleighs in the winter and then come down here in the summer, and we do different tourism activities with them down here. He just wanted to give everybody a little little piece of history, you know. He wanted that heritage to live on. That's why he gave the rides. We've done rides for the elementary school kids. We've done rides for people. He's done weddings, you know. This isn't the first time we've took somebody to the cemetery in a wagon. Um, Grandpa, he, he just wanted to share, share that legacy with everybody. The big Belgian horses did their job in majestic-like fashion, pulling the wagon and that old friend, right down Main Street, clopping their sturdy hoofs like hammers in a special farewell anthem. Grandpa would have been honored uh, to be taken to the cemetery with his own team, his own wagon. I, I led one of my saddle horses with his empty saddle. You know, he, he would have been honored to go to go out like that. We say our goodbye from an unfenced neighborhood where we found a band of wild horses roaming freely under western skies. Oh my goodness, it's a postcard anyone would like to receive. I'm James Nelson. We'll see you next time out here on Discovery Road. <laughs>